Hey, good morning. Thank you for joining us for a recent sermon from Harvest Baptist Church. I'm Mark Likens. I'm the lead pastor here at Harvest. We're a Bible-believing, gospel-centered, grace-driven church family right here in Natrona Heights, Pennsylvania. And if you'd like to learn more about our ministry, you can visit us on Facebook or at harvestbaptist.info. Now, I hope you enjoyed today's sermon. It's my prayer that this will encourage and equip you in your relationship with God. Amen. Our life is hid with Christ and God. Take your Bibles and let's look at Psalm 73. Open up, log on, scroll down, however you get there. Psalm 73. If you're getting used to your Bible, it's right in the middle. There's a book of songs, a book of meditations called the Psalms. And Psalm 73 is where we'll be at today. It is a joy to be back here at Harvest. It's been several years since I was able to fill in for Mark when he was on vacation a few years ago. My name is Brent. As was mentioned, my wife Katie is right here. And we have six children. I want to introduce them to you today. They are back at our home in Indiana, Illinois area, and uh, ages 12 down to one and a half. Emily, Abby, David, Lindsay, Amanda, and Joel. Did I, did I get them all? Okay, I did get them all. Yeah, they're all there. We're there. So it's a joy to be in the ministry. I get to help churches all over the country, and it's a privilege to be here at Harvest today. I've been praying specifically for this morning that will be a help and encouragement and challenge and be a, hopefully strengthening to each and every one of us. I'm also excited about tonight. Tonight we have a Bible workshop. And I know for some of us on a holiday weekend, you're coming back to church from 6 to 8 p.m. to talk about how to study the Bible. Why in the world would you do that? Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever read the Old Testament, Leviticus specifically, and wondered, does this apply to me? What if this does apply to me? How much of this applies to me? And how, sh- because I know I'm, I'm wearing mixed garments and you're not supposed to do that in Leviticus, but are, are you, what, what of this matters to today? And this isn't just for teachers, this isn't just for pastors, this is for dads, for moms, for all of us really, as we think to biblically understand the Word of God. All of us interpret the Word of God in some way. None of you walked in this morning bringing a sacrificial lamb with you, did you? None, I didn't see any lambs coming in the door. All of us interpret the Word of God some way. We're here on Sunday. It's not Saturday, so it's not the Sabbath. So there's a very important lessons here in how we interpret the Word of God. As I was walking in this morning, Pastor Dennis saw me and says, Hey, Brent, I'm excited about today. I'm excited about tonight. Yeah, I'm excited about this morning too, but I'm really excited about tonight. And I have been excited tonight to share with you how you and I should think about the Old Testament. What does the New Testament Christian do with the Old Testament law? And that was actually your pastor's title, because I shot him a bunch of titles. I'm not very good at titles. And he said, hey, let's let's talk about this. And I was like, this will be great. So I'm excited tonight. Six to eight is going to be very informal, very helpful, very down to earth. It will be time for questions, time for interaction. Uh, The goal tonight is not to lord over anybody, but to share how I've learned and am learning and how you and I should and can apply the Old Testament law. I hope you'll make plans to be here from 6 to 8 tonight. It'll be a fun time. Looking forward to that. Here we are in Psalm 73. Psalm 73. It's a psalm of Asaph. And you'll see that title in your Bible right there. Those titles above each of the psalms are actually inspired. They're preserved for us. And they've been with those psalms since they were given. Asaph was a unique character. And he wrote several psalms right in this section in the 70s of your Bible. He was a man who thought deeply about history. He considered the possibilities, he considered the problems, and he comes to biblical conclusions. And my goal this morning is to help all of us understand truth. Let's begin looking in verse number one, a psalm of Asaph, Psalm 73. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of 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 a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. Let me ask you a question as we get started this morning. We'll pray in a second. Why does evil exist? That's a big question. I know you probably weren't thinking that when you walked in this morning to church. Why is there evil? Let me ask you another question. Is God big? We sing in junior church, I grew up singing, my God is so big, so strong, and so... Is he really? Is God powerful? Could God today wipe away evil? Absolutely. Why doesn't he? It's a big question, isn't it? 
It's a powerful question. And how we think about that question will determine a lot of our success in the spiritual life. The message we're going to look at today from the book of from Psalm 73, Asaph's thinking, is important for each and every one of us. All of us need this truth. Many have in throughout history have come to different conclusions. In fact, even in the Bible, Habakkuk 1, Habakkuk asks, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not say, Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievances? He asked the question, God, why don't you take care of evil? In Job 21, Job and his three friends are asking and they're pondering, Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power? In fact, the entirety of the book of Job deals with the question of evil. And even Revelation, if you ever read, read Revelation 6, when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Many of us have perhaps even recently had questions. We've looked around at the news. We are living in an insane world. I don't have to tell you that. Good is being called evil, evil is being called good, and it is being forced down our throats. Why? God, why are you letting this happen? Why aren't you stopping this, God? Because we know you can. Why don't you stop evil? Well, if you've ever had those questions, pay attention, listen on, because Asaph has those same questions, and we're going to learn about them today. I know this is a holiday weekend, and many of us have different things happening even today and tomorrow. But I'm going to ask as we pray that you pray quietly. Pray that God will help us understand truth. Pray that we'll be open and honest and real. And pray that we'll take this morning from God's word what we need to. Will you do that? While, will you pray quietly while I pray out loud? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this congregation. Thank you for the truth we've been able to sing and listen to. Pray that you bless Pastor Marcus. He's away. Encourage him. Give them rest. This morning, as we look at your word, we need you. I need you. Lord, we live in a mixed-up society that has been wearing on God's people. And there's perhaps even some parents, some grandparents, even some younger people here this morning who are looking at what's happening and they're wondering, God, why are you, aren't you doing something? Lord, would your word minister? Would we see truth to help and to guide and to strengthen and to challenge? Lord, I pray you guide my words and thoughts. I can do nothing but fail, but Lord, would you change, convict, and encourage? We need you. I need you. In Jesus' name, amen. We see as we begin this morning from Psalm 73, evil examined. Look with me beginning in verse number three again. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. We can all identify with that. You look around and it seems like those who are evil have the money. They've got the prosperity. They've got the influence. They've got, they've got it, we could say. Look at verse 4. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They get to die peacefully. They get to go through their life. It seems like, isn't it unjust that Stalin and Arafat and Pol Pot, all these guys got to die peacefully? They were brutal dictators. Yes, many of them died early deaths, the Hitlers and even more recently, but many of these men in history and even women who have been absolutely monsters got to live to an old age and die. And yet at the same time, though, last century, millions of God's people were martyred for their faith. Why? Look at verse 5. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. It seems like the, the the, the leaders, the secular leaders of society, they're free from trouble. They don't get in trouble like God's people do. They're free from it. Verse number five, they're not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasses them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. They're proud. They're full of themselves. They're insulated. They've got their money, their, their security services. And we could drop names like Soros and Bezos and all those people who gather secretly to control society, or so they think. And we think about God's people who literally have been marginalized, pushed aside, and through the centuries, through the millennia, God's people have been pushed aside, and we don't have the influence. Evil just keeps going and going and going, it seems like. And yet truth gets marginalized and persecuted even. Look at verse 7. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly. 
concerning oppression, they speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, their tongue walketh through the earth. They're proud. They're self-sufficient, it says. They're, they're blasphemous. How many of us have listened to some talk show pundit blaspheming the name of our God and gone, God, why? Why do you let them have the stage? Why do you let them have the influence? Why do you let those late night people blaspheme truth? Why don't you just take them out? I'm not God, and it's very obvious I'm not. None of you are either. But if I were, you ever thought that way? If I were, there'd be a few things I'd do on day one. You're laughing. Why? Because we've all thought that. Wouldn't it be great to get rid of, you name the ideology? Wouldn't it be great to end immediately the persecution, the trafficking, the abortion, the filth, the garbage? that so plagues our society and our world. God, I know you can, but why don't you? You ever had those thoughts? That's what Asaph is doing for us this morning. Verse 9, they set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know, and is their knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. It seems like the, that the evil just keep getting more and more insulated. And, you know, the terrorist groups, they've got oil. And other groups, they've got their money and their financial backing. And it seems like God's people, we, we've got two nickels rubbed together barely. And yet, the evil keeps advancing. Asaph then examines what evil does to God's people, the effects on the righteous. God's people endure calamity, verse 10. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. They've, they've got their plate full. They've got a full cup. Man, it's just heavy right now. And no doubt many of us have turned on a news app, or we've turned on Fox or CNN or something. We've seen what's happening, and we've been like, whoa, this is horrible. You're not alone. Look what it says there, verse number 13. Asaph says, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and wash my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. He talks about his internal soul, how it's been noisy, it's been disturbed, it's been, it's been difficult. And many of us perhaps could say the same thing. We've gone through life, we've endured things, we've, we've seen things, we've thought about things, and we've even put that under our, under our saddle for a little bit and thought on it, so to speak. We're like, wow, God, why, why do you... Why do you let those people run our country? Why do you let this ideology push us and move us? Why do you, God, why didn't you stop this? Notice what it says there in verse number 15. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. Let me just be honest. You saw my six kids here just a few seconds ago. How many dads or granddads, or even moms or grandmothers here, have ever had a question internally that you didn't want to share out loud because you were afraid about it may trouble a younger generation? Has anybody had one like that? I have. Yeah, our kids go to Kid City or Junior Church, and they sing, God is so good. And we, that's true, because He is good. But we're thinking to ourselves, God, are you really? I know you are good. And we would never say it out loud, especially not in church on Sunday morning. We, we sing God is good. We, we, yes, God is good. Yeah. But inside, internally, when no one's looking, and even maybe questions we don't even share with our spouse. But inside, internally, perhaps today, some of us are, I don't know. That's bad. And perhaps some of you right now even have questions internally that you are not even sharing with your spouse, definitely not with this younger generation because you don't want to offend them. You don't want to cause them to stumble. And we internalize things and we think to ourselves, is God good? God, why, why don't you get rid of this evil? God, are you powerful enough to do that? Are you, are you even there? Are you real? I'm being very open, very honest this morning, and I've talked with and sensed and counseled many of God's people who have questioned God because of the question of evil. In theological terms, it's called theodicy. What does God do with evil? Is he going to do anything? Can he do anything with evil? These are deep questions. 
Asaph, 3,000 years ago, is pondering these things, and they're preserved and written for us, for our help, for our learning. So we've seen evil examined, we've seen the evil's effects, but now let's see evil answered. Look at verse 17 here. Look what Asaph says. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. I've got a theological truth I want to share with you, and I want you to get this. It, it may not fit logically with a lot of people, but for Christians, it's, it's what works. It's the only thing that works. God doesn't answer the question of evil throughout Scripture. Job, did he get his questions answered? You think about the book of Job. Job's like, God, what are you doing? And what does God do to Job? Where were you when I formed the earth? Where were you when I created the beast? Where were you when I flung out the heavens? And what does Job say? Uh, um... Uh, yeah, I repent, right? Habakkuk, we read a few verses from a few minutes ago. Habakkuk is this great question, Lord, why, why aren't you doing this? And what does he come to? I'm going to be quiet. God's on the throne. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I'm going to let him do his job because he's God. Even in Revelation, yes, we see that God wins, but in the, on, not on the timetable that God's people want him to win at. God does working in in ways we don't see. And the only sanity for this insane world is if you and I walk with God. Asaph came to this realization. Asaph said, oh, I've been looking at it all wrong. I've been looking at this news media, and I've been looking at this, and I've been watching this, and I've been looking at this, and this, and this, and I've been examining the evil. It just doesn't make sense. Hold on, hold on. It doesn't make sense. It won't make sense for God's people. What we have to do on a regular basis, every day, day by day, is walk with him. That is the only sanity we have in this insane, insane world. To the unsaved, that's like an ostrich sticking their head in the sand. It doesn't make sense. But for those of us who have God within, that is our way of escape through this world. It doesn't make sense. This world is crazy. And if we try to meditate on what this world is doing, it's going to drive us mad. Look what Asaph says here in verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. He says, number one, they're into short. Verse 18, surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou cast them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakeneth, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Asaph says, hey, they're not around forever. Yes, they have power now. Yes, they have influence now. Yes, they are able to afflict God's people now. But one day, they die. And that's it. Yeah, somebody else comes to take their place, but what happens to that person? It's horrible. It's horrible. We don't rejoice in that. But that's, they rejected Christ. They rejected truth. They rejected God. And that's what they get. But for you and I, God's people, if you're here today and you're a born-again child of God, you've placed your faith and trust in Christ, what happens after we die? The best is yet to come. Absolutely. Thank you for that. The best is yet to come. You know, we can get afflicted. We can get tormented. We get pushed aside, marginalized. They could even kill us. But after they kill the body, according to Luke chapter 12, they run out of ideas. They're done. They can't do anything worse. And you're like, well, Brent, that's a pretty big idea. I kind of like my body. I I, I do too. But if you're a born-again child of God, is this really our life? Is this it? No, we are strangers and pilgrims. We're passing through. This is just temporary, friend. And so if they kill us here, okay, fine with me. They run out of ideas. They're done. God has us. As we'll see, God gives us truth that we can live by. The evil goes away. The evil passes by. The evil's not forever. Look at verse number 21. We see Asaph's regret, Asaph's realization, Asaph's repentance of what he did. Thus my heart was grieved, verse 21, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. And then he gives us three truths I want us to see this morning as we finish up here. Three truths that will help us. Truth number one, verse 23, the middle part of verse 23. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Number one, truth number one, God protects me. God protects me. We've talked about it already, but... In this midst of this wicked world, God is there with us. That's 
Sounds like a Sunday school truth that we learned as little kids. But it's still truth we need for today. Absolutely. Hebrews 13, 5. We don't have to live a covetous. We don't have to live like the Gentiles because he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And so that we can boldly say, he's my helper. I won't fear what man will do unto me. Well, Brent, what, if, what happens if they actually come and they actually, the terrorists come? And what happens if the evil actually kills us? Again, what happens if you're a saved child of God when you die? What happens? Go home. Better yet, wouldn't have to vote in this midterm election. Yes. Hallelujah. Friends, we've got to keep this in realization. If you are living and vibing and meditating on news, you are not going to make it as a Christian. You and I daily have to think through the legitimate truth of the Word of God that He's there. God protects me. Can you say that with me? God protects me. We've got to think that. We've got to live it. We've got to imbibe that. Because without it, life doesn't make sense. It does, it's not fair. It's not easy. It's not fun. But to know that God is in control... And on top of that, he's sovereignly using all things together for his good. We know that all things work together for good, Romans 8, 28. Not just some things, but all things, including evil. God is big enough to use evil for his glory. That's a big God. And the way we keep that in view, the way we keep that in mind, is you and I daily have to be meditating in the Word. Friend, let me just tell it to you straight. If you're not in the Word of God on a daily basis, you're not going to make it as a Christian. You may be able to survive. You may be religious. You may even be in church faithfully, but you're not going to be able to be a successful Christian if you're not daily in the Word. This world is way too evil for that. They're out for us. They're after us. Satan's speaking his lies of deception against us. We have to be in the Word. Number one, God protects me. Look what else it says here in verse 24. It's great truth. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. Truth number two, God leads me. Can you say it with me? God leads me. You know that God has a plan for every some, one of our lives? Some Christians teach and say, well, God has a generic will for all of us as Christianity. You kind of become a Christian, you lose your will. No, no, no. God has actually created each one of us unique, different, with specific desires and drives. Thank you, I appreciate that. At least one of them is with me today. God's created you. And if you're an 18-year-old, 17-year-old, God has a plan for your life. I used to think when I was in Bible college at 19, 20, that, well, you know, when I turn like the ripe old age of 25, then I'll have God's plan for my life figured out. You know, I've come to realize that God's plan is always trusting. At age 75, Abraham left Ur not knowing where he was going. 75-year-olds, you ready to leave your home, not even know where you're going? What does that mean, though? God has a plan for me. In Psalm 1611, one of my life verses, I guess you could say, God, David says, thou wilt show me the path of life. God will show you the path of life. And Romans 12, 2 says, as we get out of the world and into the word, as we're transformed, he will show us what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Perhaps there's some young people here this morning, and you're kind of wondering, oh, I don't know. Hey, good news. Yes, the world's evil, but God has promised to lead you and guide you and protect you along the way. He's got a plan for you and I, and that's not just for young people going into college. That's for all of us. He will guide us. That's exciting. We live in a day and age when there's a lot of young people who are committing suicide at an alarming rate because they don't have purpose. They don't know what gender they are. They don't know what purpose they have. And it's sad. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking. Hey, I got good news. God knows you, loves you, and has purpose for you. He's going to guide you. That's truth to live by right there. Look what else it says here in Psalm 73. So number one, God's going to protect me. He's going to lead me. Thirdly, verse number 24, thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. God keeps me. That's better than all states' good hands. Jesus says you're in my hands in John 10, 29. God the Father says you're in my hands in John 10, 29, and 30. And the Holy Spirit was, is within. That's assurance. That's security. That's truth we can live by. Friend, I know these are simple truths. You're not learning anything new today. But as we look at this crazy, mixed up world, we've got to come back to simple truth. God protects. God leads. 
God keeps. He keeps me all the way through to the end. It's not me keeping myself, it's Him keeping me. Wow, that's a bedrock of truth. And yes, the world will look at us, what we're doing today, and say, oh, you're just Christians putting your head in the sand. You're just kind of believing this lie. It's this, it's this opiate of the people, as Marx used to say. It's just this, this nice little thought process that you go through that kind of, well, that's just nice little thinking. No, 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 this is truth. And for the world, they can't understand that, but Christ is within. Holy Spirit is within, and He's helping, He's guiding, He's assuring, He's convicting. And how do, what does He use? He doesn't just speak to us audibly. He uses the Word of God. And the Word of God is what we need. Asaph had it all wrong. He was looking at the evil. Oh, man, this is bad, and this is bad, and this is bad. God, why don't you do something? God, arise, do something. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. He will. I've read the back of the book. He wins. But what, is, what about right now? He's given us truth to live by. Dear friend, if you're not living in truth on a daily basis, let me say it again. You're not going to make it. This life's not going to make sense. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be, it is fun. It's a blast to serve God, but it may not be easy. But it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Look with me in verse 25. I know many of you have phones or you have a Bible. I'm reading from the King James. Can we read together as a congregation? Let's read it out nice and loud. Verse 25, follow along with me. Read it out with me. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Do you see the difference between verses 1 through 9 and verse number 28? Verses 1 through 9, Asaph, oh man, I know God's good, but as for me, I'm about done. I'm struggling. I, I don't know if I can keep going. Verse number 28, it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Where do you want to live? In verses 1 through 10 or verse 28? As a dad, as a grandfather, as a grandmother, as a grandparent, where do you want to live? Where do you want to show your generation, the next generation? Where do you want to live? Verse 28. So how do we do that? By thinking positive thoughts and get rid of those negative friends? No, no, no. By putting our trust in the Lord God by meditating on the Word of God, by imbibing truth. And yes, this world is crazy, absolutely crazy. We've called evil good and good evil. We've elected evil. Ah. But hey, God's still on His throne. And it's not just that He's an aloof, impersonal God who doesn't have a plan for us. No, no, no. He protects us. He leads us. He keeps us all the way Till the end. That's truth to live by. Perhaps today there's some Christians here, you've been perturbed, upset, and you haven't even shared it with your spouse. You've come to church today and you're, it's heavy. Turn on the news. Oh man, it's heavy. And oftentimes, God's people, we escape. We escape to video games, we escape to sports, we escape to work because we don't want to think about this. Friend, we don't have to escape. We can do business with truth. We can walk with God. We can enjoy Him, walk with Him in the midst of absolute insane evil. Perhaps today God spoke, God challenged, God ministered to you. But perhaps you're here and you've never placed your faith and trust in Christ. You're here and I'm glad you are. You're somewhat religious because you're here on a Sunday morning. I appreciate that, but it's not about religion. It's not about being a Baptist. It's not about being any denomination. To get to heaven, there's one thing we got to get rid of, our sin. And different churches will tell you, well, do this, be this, do this, look like this, and you'll get rid of your sin. doesn't work. Nothing can. Nothing ever will. Never ever has. Church will say, get baptized, be good, catechized, compromise, whatever ism you want to put on there, still won't work. What we need is a Savior. Christ died for our sin. Not a new thought. Perhaps you've seen movies, pictures about that. 
But here's the great news. You can't do it. He can. He loves you, wants to save you. And what you must do and I must do, the Bible calls it repentance. What does that mean? Reject everything that's keeping us from Christ. It's not my religion. It's not my church membership. It's not my good works. It's not anything like that. I reject all of that. And faith, I place my faith, my trust, my dependence completely solely on the personal work of Jesus Christ. He died, was buried, rose again for my sin. I'm trusting him and him alone for my salvation. If you've never done that, good news. This morning, God's talking to you. There's a purpose for your being here. It's that. God loves you, wants to save you. And if you'll reject you and trust him, you can have eternal life. Hallelujah. What a savior. For believers here this morning, it's not getting any better. Sorry, it's not. But hey, God's truth is still there. God hasn't changed. And the only sanity we have is knowing and walking daily with him. Are you? Hey, this is Pastor Mark again, and I wanted to take a moment and just say thank you for tuning in to today's message. I hope that the message both challenged and encouraged you from the Word of God. Maybe you're listening for the first time. I want you to know that we believe the most important decision you'll ever make is the decision to know Jesus in a personal, intimate way. To find out more about that, you can visit harvestbaptist.info forward slash gospel. If you live in one of the four counties that are church borders, Allegheny, Westmoreland, Armstrong, Butler, and you don't have a church home, then we would invite you to come and to worship with us and join in the gospel work that God is doing here at Harvest Baptist Church. Maybe you're a regular listener and God's laying it on your heart to support the ministry and the outreach of Harvest. Your gift would help us reach more people more effectively with the gospel message. If you'd like to partner with us for ministry in Western Pennsylvania and around the world, you can visit harvestbaptist.info forward slash give. Again, thank you for listening and we'll see you next time.